time because I don't know if the other sessions have finished yet. So yeah, we've got a few people joining us right now, so that's good. Super, okay. People are flooding in. Thank you, everyone. We'll just give it a little, another 30 seconds or so. Let some people, more people come in. Sure. <laughs> Hi, James. How are you? Okay. Thank you, everybody, for uh, ducking out on your 15-minute break. We really appreciate that. Um, and it's all because we had a request, late request, um, from Dr. Michael Hayden, who is just wonderful and has been a complete HD advocate for so many years that we just could not say no to him. Um, and he's got something very useful, important to talk to us about uh, with regards to his proof HD study with the Prolinear. So without further ado, Dr. Michael Hayden, thank you. Thank you, Matthew, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know that uh, people are joining this from all over the world, uh, including maybe even South Africa. So I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to sh give you all a quick update uh, on the Proof HD study. Uh, I must say, I've uh, watched HDO with great uh, interest and with great support, and I'm so impressed by what you've all done and also managing uh, in these uh, crazy and constricted times. So congratulations to everybody who's part of HDO. So I want to share with you a, a, a quick update on the proof Huntington study, which is the predominant outcome on function. And this is now underway, and it's underway in 60 sites around the world, half in Europe, half in the USA and Canada. It's a phase three pivotal study that's evaluating if, if efficacy uh, and safety of predopidine in patients with early HD. And this is what the study is primarily trying to address. It's not looking at career, um, but rather looking at function, trying to see whether this drug can manifest any impact on maintaining or maintenance of functional capacity. And as we know, this is an area of uh, very significant uh, worry for families. How do we maintain function? Of course, as everybody knows, there are only two drugs approved for Huntington disease. There's tetrabenazine and the drug I took to approval at Teva, deuterated tetrabenazine in the United States, but that mostly treats chorea. Uh, and has no impact on function. So predopidine is a small molecule drug. Uh, it's given twice a day. Uh, it's safe and tolerable with great side effect profile. Uh, it has shown in post hoc analysis, maintenance of functional capacity. We've also shown that it may go on for as long as five years and that's as long as it's been looked at. And it binds the sigma one receptor. That's the mechanism of action highly selective and increases the activity of sigma one. And we've shown this, this is just looking at a brain scan. And here you can see using a, 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 a agent that lights up sigma one, and here you can see it lights up, sigma one is present throughout the brain. And then you give your drug and you see how much displacement occurs and you can see complete displacement, which indicates that this drug is a very selective binder to sigma one. There is no occupancy of other receptors. So it's really a very selective sigma one agonist. And the sigma one receptor is highly expressed in areas of the brain that are important in HD, the basal ganglia, the cortex, but also expressed, for example, in the brainstem and spinal cord. And prior studies have shown that if you activate, activate sigma one in numerous studies, you can reduce death of neurons, 
it maintains function uh, in neuronal health, it increases the connectivity in the brain and reduces neuroinflammation. And we've shown uh, with in Huntington disease that if you, and these are models uh, in vitro in cell as well as in vivo in animal studies, that there's significant neuroprotection. You get enhancement of clearance of toxic proteins, improvement of the mitochondria, decreased stress, you get release of important protective factors, it restores uh, uh, calcium homeostasis, enhances the connectivity, and these pathways are impaired actually before the onset of symptoms. So it has impact on a lot of the pathways that are important. And for example, here, what you can see, and this is work done uh, by Chris Ross's lab at Johns Hopkins, and this is looking at wild type versus mutant and cell death. And what you can see, there's enhanced cell death in these cells. And then when you treat with pradopidine, you can restore this completely. And then when you delete a gene, just one gene, sigma-1 receptor knockout, you lose the effect. Predopidine now is no effect. So we know that this is mediated exquisitely through the sigma-1 receptor. The drug has been used a lot. It's safe and tolerable. It has a side effect profile comparable to placebo. It's taken orally twice a day and easy to take with a, a excellent safety and tolerability profile. These are some of the side effects which we won't go through, but there's no increase from placebo. Nausea the same, you know, diarrhea pretty much the same, headaches the same. So nothing that really causes any concern in terms of tolerability. Now, when you measure function, this is the, uh, the, the, the scale that is associated and accepted by the regulators at EMA and FDA for function. It measures occupation how you manage your finances, what you do at home, domestic chores, whether you can dress yourself and continue with activities of daily living and who takes care of you. And this, uh, this particular scale has now, there's been evolution in the regulatory authorities and acceptors as a single primary endpoint. And this really changed when patients and families, uh, including patients youthful like you guys, uh, who went to the FDA and emphasized that the issue that really is most important is to continue to maintain functional capacity, to continue working, to continue maintaining of such simple tasks and not being dependent on others. And in our meetings with the EMA and the, uh, the FDA, they acknowledge the importance of this as a single primary endpoint and certainly there's never been a drug that has shown an effect on TFC and any beneficial effect would be considered clinically meaningful. And this is what we showed in our phase two study that was extended to 52 weeks precisely because we uh, had some data to show that the target was sigma one. And what you can see here, uh, this was, uh, uh, we looked at both the pre-specified analysis for TFC in the whole group, but this is looking at early HD patients where this scale is most useful. And you can see placebo goes down one. And in patients with early HD defined as a TFC seven or greater, they really, these patients had maintenance of their functional capacity out to 52 weeks. This was exciting. This was the only trial that's ever shown an effect on maintaining a functional capacity with any analysis. And you can see in placebo, it usually goes down 0.7 to one. And there've been numerous trials that have looked at annual progression of TFC. None have shown an effect until we had predopidine, which showed some maintenance of functional capacity, which was very exciting. Furthermore, when you wanted to look at how much and uh, the, the responder analysis, which is what's the decrease in the probability of worsening. And what you can see here in this responder analysis, this was reduced by about 80%. So all of this encouraged us to be able to do a phase three trial in an effort to assess this oral and safe drug uh, in the, uh, for the potential to maintain functional capacity. And here you can see also, in a, this is an open label study, uh, but what you can see here is that this effect has been shown 
in the past to be durable. This is open heart, where the patients were followed for some period of time, up to five years, and it's down one us 1.8. And this is a placebo, but it's not matched. So it's a open label, but you can see one expects this to go down five, big difference. So it looks like the effect could potentially be durable. And that's also very important. So this leads us to the phase three trial that is now ongoing uh, in 60 sites, 30 in the US and 30 in Europe. Uh, the first patient was randomized in October. Progress is going very well. About half the sites have been activated. And the endpoint, and this is a 65 week study for early HD with 240 patients per arm uh, and nine countries in Europe are, are engaging in this uh, with 30 sites. The, the investigators in Europe in this trial, the PI is Ralph Riemann and the co-PI is Anne Rosser. And the study has been officially endorsed by the EHDN as well as supported by uh, HDSA. The primary endpoint is changed to baseline in TFC and there are numerous secondary endpoints which include a responder analysis, motor, cognitive, and quality of life studies. And this study is now ongoing. We expect this trial, and here are the investigative data in North America. It's Andy Fagan, who's, and it's been done together with the Huntington Study Group, Ralph Riemann, uh, PI in Europe, with Anne Rosser uh, uh, from Cardiff, and Sandra Kostick from uh, Ohio State. And this is the trial, it's ongoing. The trial has started. It started essentially in Q4, the last quarter of 2020. We expect the trial to read out by the end of 2022, uh, where we'll be able to determine whether this drug has been able to replicate the findings we saw in phase two, and whether in this uh, uh, very open, uh, within this double blind placebo controlled trial, this shows. Uh, uh, whether it can show to maintain functional capacity in HD. And that would of course be great because this would uh, be an oral drug that's easy to take and allow access uh, 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 to many uh, without any particular intervention. So uh, I thank you all. I'm delighted to uh, also hopefully have many of you participate in the study. There is an age limit of 25 and above. There's no upper age limit. So I encourage you to uh, be in touch or let your parents or others know around you about the study that's ongoing uh, because uh, recruitment is ongoing at this particular point. So thank you all very much. And Matt, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Uh, and it's great to have this although a uh, remote possibility of talking to everyone. And I do hope everybody stays safe and healthy through these difficult times. And hopefully we can get together in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so, and we have a couple of minutes for those questions. So let's do our best. <laughs> um, so Natalie's asking, uh, if phase three is successful, how long will it take to be available in Canada slash North America? Well, if phase three is successful, and we'll know this uh, towards the end of 22 or maybe 23, it depends on recruitment. Uh, this would then, I would say, because there's uh, at the moment no drug that has impact on functional capacity, we'd hope to have a rapid review. We would look to submission. Uh, before the end of 23. So this drug we would hope would be available early 24 or sometime mid 24. So about three years from now. Thank you, thank you. And also, what would the potential cost for the drug be? If you can say anything on that? Well, um, again, uh, cost has not been worked out, but let's make it this way. I do wanna make sure that, um, that this uh, drug is made available to as many people around the world, uh, particularly if it's easy to take and safe and efficacious. So I think it's gonna be, uh, 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 you know, it's gonna be a novel drug. 
but I'm hoping to have pricing that makes this available to many around the world. Wonderful. And we have some more questions. So can pre-symptomatic people take the drug or be involved in the trial? That's a great question. And of course, the earlier the better. You want to treat uh, when there's smoke and no fire. So you want to treat patients as early as possible. And we're, try we're hoping to be able to do a trial in pre-manifest patients in the future so that this drug, if safe and tolerable and efficacious, could even be used earlier. So that's something that we'd like to raise additional support for as part of a ongoing trial to, so that you can treat uh, patients pre-symptomatically to provide neuroprotection before there is significant neuronal loss. Thank you, Michael. And we have one more question. In which countries is phase three recruitment taking place? And just to say, of course, this drug works in a totally different mechanism to ASOs because it be, could be taken in combination. The, the countries where recruitment is being uh, uh, now is in the US, Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, Spain, France, the Netherlands, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Italy. Um, and I think uh, I've spoken about, all, and of course, Germany. Um, I think those are the countries where this is taking place. On the other hand, uh, we also would like to recruit to those countries. So if you're not in a site where this is taking place, there will be support to get you to a site. It's not very onerous. Uh, there's not many in-person visits. A lot of this can be done virtually. And so this will be available, uh, hopefully, to many. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, really appreciate your time and answering the questions, um, especially on your weekend. And we um, thank you, everybody, for your chat and your questions. We appreciate it. We're going to have to end the session here now because we've got more sessions coming up. So on track one, we've got Unicure's HG research update. And on track two, we've got Lal Turner. Hopefully, if we can get him um, talking about his Mount Everest attempt for HD awareness. Once again, thank you, Dr. Michael Hayden. A pleasure to see you again. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, Michael. Enjoy the football. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye.